Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business App. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. One other stock we're watching today uh, is Home Depot. It's off by about 1.5%. The company said it's going to buy building products distributor SRS Distribution, a roofing company, for about $18.25 billion. So I want to get more on that. And who do we go to? The best guy in the housing industry when it comes to anal- analysts. Uh, Drew Redding is Bloomberg Intelligence U.S. home building analyst uh, joining us. All right, what do you make of the acquisition and the fact the stock's down? Yeah, so this this deal, $18.25 billion, is Home Depot's largest ever acquisition. Um, prior to this one, its largest deal was the $8 billion deal it did for HD Supply back in 2020. Um, SRS did about $10 billion of revenue. So for a company as big as Home Depot, um, this is actually a pretty big deal. And we think it fits with their strategic plan of going after that professional customer. Um, it's a very highly fragmented market. You know, our view has been that if they really want to accelerate their growth, particularly in this segment of the market, um, they would probably have to do a couple of deals. They did a deal, the one I mentioned, HD Supply, back in 2020. Um, They recently did a deal for International Designs Group, and now they added on with this one. Um, You mentioned the stock is down. You, You know, as I mentioned, it's a pretty big deal. And I think the fact that people are still kind of hoping and waiting for that the underlying housing market to kind of return to growth. And that's really the, the primary driver of Home Depot's business. I think the fact that you're layering this on top of, you know, those market expectations may be weighing a little bit. I see. I'm looking at the structure of the deal. First, I go to MA Go, which is the first thing I do for an M&A story and to see who the bankers and lawyers are and MA Go does not have that information I'm very disappointed Aww. so I have to talk to the That's MA people maybe it hasn't been disclosed um, they're going to go to the debt markets here they do have a little bit of cash on the balance sheet here but um, they're going to finance it with some debt is that okay with you and the credit analysts out there yeah so their, their leverage is going to tick up uh, debt to EBITDA about two and a half times the goal going forward is to deleverage over the next 24 months to get back to a, a kind of two times target so it's it's not that much of a concern at this point um, you know, in order to do that, the, the, the goal is obviously to accelerate growth, but at the same time, they're going to put their share repurchases on hold in order to get that leverage back down in a oh. timely fashion. There's okay, well, there you go. That's why the stock's down. Um, this is why I love anchoring with Paul, because it's like two different perspectives. I'm like, what's the macro read? And you're like, <laughs> let's talk about how they're paying for it. This is perfect. This is why Paul Sweeney is so awesome. Um, but to the point of like the why, this is not like John Tucker renovating a closet to a bathroom, right? Like it's not that. Like these are the real people. Yeah, these are the the professional remodelers. So, SRS um, caters to specialty trade contractors. So think building materials, um, primarily roofing, as well as landscape and pool. So building materials are about two thirds of their business, and the pool and landscape pieces are about a, th- a third. Um, those are actually newer markets that they entered in through through M&A. So Home Depot's main strategy is going after an untapped $200 billion market for what they call complex projects. And you think about a professional contractor who is typically juggling you know, a handful of supplier relationships for a larger scale job. They might have to go to one distributor for windows. They may have to go somewhere else for flooring, somewhere else for doors, yeah, and so on and so forth. And so Home Depot's goal and their strategy is to kind of consolidate um, hmm. the need for contractors to go to all those different suppliers. You want to become a one-stop shop. Talk to me about just kind of the economics of that business. Like, what's the, is there a difference between selling a piece of plywood to the John Tuckers of the world versus selling a piece of plywood to, you know, a local contractor? Well, professional contractors are typically higher spending. Um, and you see yes. that if you, if you look at the, the store productivity um, of a Home Depot compared to Lowe's after the last several years, you see that the, the Sales per square foot, sales per store, highly, um, much stronger for Home Depot. And a lot of that has to do with the spending nature of that pr- professional contractor. I see. Okay. I mean, just look at John Tucker. Like, he's definitely not going to be spending that high. He's not going to the high end place in Home Depot. But he Depot. does high quality work, though, I'm sure. Oh, oh, oh no, no. <laughs> totally into the high quality work, 100%. Um, so it sounds like you think this deal makes sense where does it put it then in relation to Lowe's which I I must assume has to be trying to carve out its own niche in that 
Yeah, so it's a good question. And the <clears throat> the strategy, um, you know, in attacking the pro segment between Home Depot and Lowe's is a little bit different. As, as I mentioned, Home Depot is targeting kind of that larger pro, whereas Lowe's is, is kind of focusing on that small and medium sized medium sized contractor. Um, and this is kind of an area they've been emphasizing over the last couple of years, because prior to 2018, when the new CEO, Marvin Ellison, came in, Lowe's didn't really have a dedicated pro strategy. Um, it was kind of all over the place. So they their their you know philosophy has let's get get back to the fundamentals of the business. Let's have the right brands. Let's make sure we have things in stock. Let's make sure we have the proper quantities and the right staffing. So they're kind of coming from a different position where they're getting back to basics, where Home Depot already has that dominant position and they're looking to expand into an untapped market. All right, let's step back, Drew. Um, talk to us about what's going on in the housing market. What's the, what's the elevator pitch you're giving to clients these days? How are investors approaching the housing market? Because I don't see a lot of houses for sale, dude. Yeah, so I mean, we've talked before in the way we describe housing as a tale of two markets. We still think that the new home market is in the driver's seat, both from a supply perspective and from an affordability perspective. Um, the most important thing to remember is that builders are growing their community counts. They're bringing new products to market. And unlike what you see in the resale market, they're making financing more attractive. So they're buying down rates. So right now, if you if you look out there in the market, you're seeing something you know in the 6.9, 7% range on a 30-year fixed. Um, you know, if you go to the new home market, you're seeing something much lower. You probably have a five handle. So the math mm. looks a lot better in the new home market. Interestingly, um, more recently, we have started to see a little bit more inventory come to the market in the resale side, you know, which which you mentioned has been kind of the the major theme permeating throughout the industry. So we could see that start to help volumes. We think that the, the resale market starts to rebound later in this year and maybe sees a little bit of modest growth. I have a really dumb question. If if I want to sell my apartment and I have a 2.75% 30-year fix, can I sell that rate along with the apartment? No. It's a hard <laughs> the, no. The, it's a hard the, no. The, the buyer in your market is going to be coming with something significantly higher. Now, there, there, there are ways where, you know, through various concessions, a seller can help a buyer kind of lower that rate, you know, if the, if the buyer were to pay points and then, you know, the seller can contribute to closing costs, that's one way to do it. But, you know, as you mentioned, that's one of the, well, that's the primary reason why people aren't putting their homes on the market. And it's mm. also what's what's keeping people from making purchases. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a very clear. Also, why would I do that? Yeah. You're, yeah, I'm not, you're I'm in not, there forever. No, I'm there forever. I'm for sure. This was not like a promo. Like, unless I win the lottery. Yeah, you guys are there no forever, way. right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Because that interest rate is just unbelievable. Makes it's unreal. It's yeah. also a condo. Yeah. So then you can always rent it out, like, if I move somewhere else or whatever. Like, it's ah. it, it, from that perspective. Even a co-op, though, I wouldn't yeah. okay. in a million years. Hey, Drew, thanks a lot. Really appreciate Drew Redding, Bloomberg Intelligence, U.S. home building analyst. And just so you're all clear, that is a 2.75% 30-year fix that nice. I got in 2020. Just putting that, that out there. That is awesome. I, just, I, I feel like it's important to Me, on the other hand, saying. in 2023, <laughs> March of 2023, even 6%. Yeah, but that now feels good. Yeah, like I felt like a complete knucklehead at the time. Like, oh, you're supposed to be a Wall Street guy, and you're just paying through the nose here on the rates. Um, but boy, then they went up to seven. Yeah, you know, now, yeah I, I have a friend who's trying to buy a house, first home, home buyer, like you know, ground up, like 30 years old kind of thing. And it's it's really hard. Tough, like it's really tough. And it's yeah. like, when do you do that? The prices haven't really matched up uh, with those higher rates. So anyway, there we go. I'm glad we got that all out of the way. <laughs> You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. All right, to the markets we go. We're seeing a little bit of a sell-off in the front end. Yields up just a touch, despite some pretty hawkish-ish uh, messaging coming out from Chris Waller uh, y yesterday evening where it seemed like it was uh, we're going to be waiting. We're going to be waiting and waiting and waiting. Ira Jersey is Bloomberg Intelligence Chief U.S. Interest Rate Strategist uh, joining us now. Um, Ira, I'll read you the quote. In my view, it is appropriate to reduce the overall number of rate cuts or push them further into the future in response to the recent data. There's still no rush. These were two remarks to the Economic Club of New York as of yesterday. What does that tell us? 
<laughs> yeah, well, it's a continuation of what some of the more hawkish members of the Federal Reserve have been saying. Um, yeah, you know, we think that uh, Governor Waller probably is in the two cut this year camp. So, you know, there's an, when you look at the dot plot and, and we only received it, uh, you know, last week. So uh, so it's very fresh. Um, we think that he's one uh, one of the people in the two cut camp. So um, mm -hmm. but but so that means that he's maybe kind of the spokesperson for the more hawkish members of the committee, whereas, you know, uh, it's still a bulk of the committee is in the, the, the three cut camp. I, I think the important thing about Governor Waller's comments is. Um, you know, you can't you can't be assured of a June cut um, at, at the moment. Like in order to get a June cut, you need to probably have a continuation of uh, slowing economic activity and certainly a, um, a decline in inflation. And, and, you know, we put out a piece just this morning saying, look, if we keep getting, you know, point two inflation prints for the next couple of months, that's not going to lower the year on year inflation number at all. So, uh, yeah, you know, so, so it's it's unclear to us whether or not, you know, June or July or, or even maybe the, the Fed might have to wait till November. And that's where you can get a lot of um, uh, a lot of market pricing shifts if uh, if we don't price in for a June or July cut anymore and we wind up pushing things out even further. So, Ira, tomorrow, um, I'm not going to be here. Markets are going to be <laughs> equity markets are going to be closed here. Uh, yet we're getting uh, bond markets real... closed, too, there, Paul. What's that? <laughs> Bond market is closed too. Okay, I don't want. I don't want to speak for the bond market people. You guys have your own little club over there. Um, PCE deflator. We're going to get some meaningful information tomorrow. Um, odd timing aside, how do you think the Fed's thinking about the data tomorrow? The PCE deflator, the core deflator, is expected to come in at zero point three percent. Yeah, so zero point three is a continuation of, of the trend, and yeah, you know, b b given that we have CPI, I think that PC will kind of take a little bit of a backseat to some of the other details that that we're going to parse through, particularly since the market's closed. So there won't be the same kind of knee jerk reaction you might get in in uh, in the U.S. markets anyway. Um, Europe will still be open, so so that'll or parts of Europe will still be open. So that'll be interesting to to, to see how they react, and and that'll give you a clue as to how we'll open up at seven p.m. on uh, Sunday night in in the Treasury market. Um, the uh, you know what I'll be looking for in this in these numbers is a continuation of the actual consumption trends because remember even though we get that very important uh, PC deflator so the inflation component of the PC report you also get personal consumption numbers so actually what people are spending their money on um, uh, how how things are growing and, and what I like to look at is what's called the quanti the the quantity indices so these are basically real spending and how those are developing and what you've seen of late. Is is that even though you've had a little bit of a leveling off in people spending on durable goods, the number, uh, the amount of money that people are spending on services continues to go up. And you even saw that today in the GDP report, the, all of the revisions of the fourth quarter GDP came because of higher consumption of services, and, and that was revised higher. And as long as uh, services continue to be a, a big focus and people are content to continue to spend on services, there's a there's a feedback loop because that's where most of the people in the United States are employed. So, so as long as people are spending on services, that means that services are going to be making money and that people can request wage increases. Those wage increases then can go back and be spent again on services, right? So, so, so I think that the, that those are the kinds of numbers and some of the detail that I think will be important as to whether or not um, you know the economy is really going to be starting to slow and if that will feed into then lower inflation. Because even in the inflation components, what we'll be looking for is how much is services inflation versus goods inflation. Goods inflation has been zero basically for the last six months. And it's all everything, all of the inflation has really been coming from the services sector. So that, that has to be everyone's focus right now. Oh, sorry. It's that pesky button where <laughs> I press off, but I mean on. And anyway, I wish my husband probably wishes he had that button. But anyway, um, what I was saying is that goods uh, inflation too, the disinflation narrative around that is also coming into question potentially when you have the Baltimore Bridge collapse, etc. Ira, you're still at two. Is the risk that you actually pair that down to one or zero, or is the risk that it's actually three? Yeah, I, well, I think that the well, the market's still priced for three cuts this year. Um, now, you know, we were pricing just two months ago six cuts, right? Six one hundred and fifty basis points of interest rate cuts. Yeah, I, I think the risk is that the the Fed starts a little bit later, but the path looks very similar to what's being priced right now. Um, so it, it's more that things get pushed fo forward and forward and forward. And keep in mind, you know, the market will often price for outcomes that aren't going to be realized, and and that's where you know we try. 
that, that that's where strategists and and portfolio managers can kind of you know make their living in trying to determine what's kind of mispriced and and what are the highest probability outcomes. Yeah, you know, interestingly, uh, you know, to to your point. Um, you know, there is a risk that there's actually no cuts this year and, and the market is actually pricing for upwards of a 20 percent chance of that. If you look at options on short term interest rate futures like the uh, futures on SOFR. Um, uh, so our options model suggests that that, you know, there's a pretty high prob possibility being priced that, you know, the, the Fed's on hold. And you even saw some activity this morning. You know, Ed Bolenbrook, who does a really good job with uh, looking at flows in the short term interest rate markets for Bloomberg News, he even noted this morning that there were people buying, but uh, buying uh, puts on uh, on these futures that suggest that the uh, that that the Fed might not actually cut at all uh, this year. So so I, I think that there is a there is a growing kind of community out there that's that's fearful that yep. the economy won't slow down enough for the Fed to actually cut. All right, we'll see. Ira Jersey, thank you so much. We appreciate that as always. Ira Jersey. He's the chief of his interest rate strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence, uh, joining us from Princeton, New Jersey, via that uh, Zoom thing. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. So let's get back to what... Governor Waller talked about. And that was basically like, we're just not there yet. Let's wait, let's wait, let's wait. And then it's raising the risk of maybe no cuts uh, this year, which leads me to the market reaction. The overwhelming idea in the first quarter was that you're going to have bonds outperform stocks because we were going to get cuts. That obviously didn't work out for you. So what do you do for the second quarter? Joining us now is David Kudla. He's founder, CEO, and chief investment strategist over at Mainstay Capital Management. Uh, and he joins us now. David, is this going to be another quarter of stocks outperforming bonds? I think it will be. I think that stocks are in rally mode. Uh, we're almost in a, a melt up situation that the, the increase we've had in 2024 alone, the increase we've had now over the past five months has just been incredible. And the problem with the problem for bonds uh, is that uh, we keep, you know, we talked about six or seven Fed rate cuts just a few months ago. We're down to two or three, maybe one. They're getting moved out. They were March, got moved out to June, moving out as far as September. We may not see a rate cut this year. So uh, that's problematic for bonds, obviously. And we've seen what the 10-year and, and the rest of bonds have done because of that. What we've done, uh, where you do have opportunity in bonds, though, for your portfolio, for someone in a 60-40 portfolio, they need that bond allocation stay ultra short on uh, ultra short term bonds. So you have very little duration, very little interest rate sensitivity, but we have these high yields we're still getting with rates being this high. So that is an attractive part of the yield curve for a bond allocation. But, uh, you know, stocks, I think, continue to be on roll. We, we are due uh, for a pullback at any time here of four or 5%. We've gone so long without as much as a 2% pullback in a day and any meaningful pullback. But, uh, you know, we're still very constructive on stocks and constructive relative to bonds. So, David, where are we in terms of valuation here? How do you think about the valuations in the equity markets if, you know, maybe we're in this melt up kind of mode? Yeah, so we're getting a little rich. Uh, we're at 20.9 is, uh, let's call it 21, uh, forward price earnings on the S&P 500. Uh, the five-year average is around 19, so we're you know we're a little bit rich, uh, not as not as rich as we've seen in the past, and you know there's a lot of people referring to this as a bubble, and I think that that people that think we're in a bubble for stocks haven't studied a lot of bubbles to know you know what that really means. When we look at the fundamentals, you know we have some of these growth stocks and the megatech stocks trading at higher PEs in the 20s and 30s but they deserve it, right? And so, you know, we think that uh, we can still, and you, you never wanna make a market call based on valuation, right? Stocks can stay undervalued or overvalued for a very, very long time. So while they're they're starting to get a little bit stretched, that's not a, a, a big concern for us because I think the fundamentals are still there to support it. So based on that though, 
I guess, because you're right. Like, it can always still go higher, even if it's overvalued, right? If the equity mm -hmm. market, for example. But do you need to also rotate? So maybe you're not going to sell the MAG-7, for example, or sell NVIDIA, but do you need to rotate into more cyclicals? And like, what do, or quality, what does that wind up looking like? Right. So, you know, what, what we favor right now, our, our overall investment strategy can be summed up very easy, large over small, growth over value, the U.S. over foreign. Uh, outside of the U.S., we, we, we also like Japan. But uh, the, the key here in diversification is, you know, we're seeing industrials, financials, some of the other uh, areas starting to perform better. We're seeing more breadth in the market, but we would stay. With that, with mega cap tech, uh, the power of generative AI. Uh, they just announced uh, healthcare assistants, basically that do the work of a nurse. Uh, you know, there's just it's entering so it's going to enter so much of our lives be in in the professional workplace, be transformational. So we've narrowed the our magnificent seven down to to our own Fab Four. We took out mm. Apple, Google and tesla and and though that fabulous Google. four is up that fabulous four is up 38 percent this year and you know really it's become you know surprisingly enough somewhat of a safety trade to go to these stocks when rates are going higher they don't care about interest rates they have plenty of free cash flow to fund operations and their research and development so it, it just it, it remains to be a good core of the portfolio but there's some other places you can look out we, we'd avoid small caps until we know rates are coming down, also with cyclicals. Uh, mid caps, though, we've increased our exposure to uh, is, is an area, you know, the, 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 the in-betweeners that uh, uh, they're, they've grown out of the small cap camp, not the large cap yet, but mid caps have, have uh, also started to shine as well. Other sectors, David, uh, besides some of those technology names, we've heard some folks talk about healthcare, uh, some folks talk about financials, Either of those get your attention? Yeah, financials, healthcare, industrials, uh, especially we, we think it makes sense to, you know, we want to have a diversified portfolio. We, we are uh, overweight tech. It's our highest weighting by far, or IT uh, and communications. But uh, we, we, we do think that as rates start to come down, you know, when the, when the yield curve finally gets back to looking like something normal, that will be very helpful for financials. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see industrials can it do well. We, when we look towards this year, we're not looking for recession, you know, and, and, and we uh, think we could have a soft landing, but our, we, we think it's more about a no landing. It's, it's more that we'll have a slowdown and, and reaccelerate. We've got GDP was just revised for the fourth quarter to 3.4%, the economy's mm -hmm. strong, labor remains strong. Uh, there's some indicators out there with, you know, the level of bankruptcies, credit card debt, credit card interest rates, uh, what's happening in housing. There's some worrisome areas, but the economy just keeps chugging along David, here. Wouldn't that scenario, though, be good for industrials, materials, uh, energy, like those sectors? Yeah, yeah. And we're seeing there's some other reasons in, in energy. There always are. Uh, you know, a geopolitical risk premium and so forth. Uh, we've seen what oil's been doing. Uh, we've seen what cocoa's been doing. Uh, I uh, just, I think it's everybody's high. It's having very a lot high. of fun. Yes. It's very expensive. Yeah, everybody's, everybody's <laughs> having a lot of fun with that one. Uh, maybe needing to avoid as much, maybe not the chocolate uh, Easter egg this year, but, uh, uh, you know, there, there are commodities doing better. Uh, and, and actually, you know, the cocoa story is just incredible. But, uh, yeah, we think that, yeah, it, materials uh, with a more normal yield curve, financials, um, health care, certainly, that's uh, a large sector for us as well. All right, David, thank you so much for joining us. David Kudla, he's a founder, chief executive officer and chief investment officer for Main State Capital Management. Uh, Troy, Michigan is where he hails from, so we got him via Zoom there. <laughs> You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Nobody likes a good little M&A trade more than me, and that's what Amazon's up to. They invested $2.75 in AI startup Anthropic. So when we talk about uh, Amazon, one of the 
voices we have to get on board is Anurag Ran, a senior technology analyst for uh, Bloomberg Intelligence. Anurag, um, tell us about Anthropic. What is Anthropic and is why is Amazon investing another $2.75 billion into this company? Uh, yeah, Paul. So think of Anthropic as very similar to OpenAI. It's a company that develops its large language models that people can use to do, you know, whatever AI-related chatbots and other kind of analysis that they want to do. Now, the thing is, as you know, OpenAI, when Microsoft invested in them, uh, OpenAI runs on Microsoft's cloud. And this is what Anthro and, uh, Amazon wants. It wants Anthropic's you know, core business to run on their cloud. People go out and experiment with them. You know, that's kind of feeds into their cloud business. How much have they now spent on AI cloud stuff? On Amazon, yeah. see, one of the things is this is just a you know few billion dollars over here. But I would I would argue that the base that they are doing, or the the, the base architecture, or the base infrastructure that they have on cloud, you know, they've spent over hundred billion dollars over it, uh, wow. you know, in the last 10, 15 years. So they, they, this is a big enough number because you can't run a lot of these models without being on cloud. Now that's not. Truly true, there are, you can run it on-premise, on, on the device also, but a large portion of the processing will be done on the cloud. Just to follow on that, how does that compare to its other competitors in the biz? It's a, one of the things I would say is, um, you know, Microsoft, I, you know, I, I don't think that they got lucky. They really knew what they were investing in when it went to OpenAI. OpenAI came up with its product far, far sooner than anybody else, and that's why all of us talk about it. But companies like Anthropic, I think it's, you know, I won't call them behind, but I'm, I'm sure that their models are going to be used by other people also. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing in just in some of the reporting here. Anthropic, so this isn't exclusive to Amazon. I mean, it seems like Anthropic has, you know, tie-ups with Google uh, as well, Spark, and some others. So what's really the strategic value for Amazon here? I think they call themselves their preferred cloud vendor. And again, for Amazon's point of view, what they're doing is they're giving people a laundry list of multiple models they can use. They can use Amazon's own model. They can actually use Meta's model called Llama, or they can use Anthropic and a, and a, and a couple others. So, um, you know, if, if, I'm a, if I'm an enterprise, if I'm a big, large bank, and I want to experiment with them, it's my choice what I want to use over there. And that's really what Amazon's selling. See, this is where Anurag and I and our world can collide. Power. Oh, here we go. Here I saw we that go. coming. Yeah, I was like, You well, waited the proper amount did of time. I, I yes. thought I should have waited for like a couple more minutes, but I just had to go there. We can always go back. It's cool. So Anurag, um, well, I was just down uh, at, in Texas for Sarah Week, which is like Energy's big Super Bowl, and the only conversation everyone was having was about power uh, and power demand skyrocketing due to data centers and AI, et cetera, and that Amazon had bought a nuclear power reactor center in order to power one of their data centers. Can you just talk me through, the more they invest in AI and stuff, does that just mean they have to just go buy more power plants? <laughs> Yeah, if you look at capital expenditures for Microsoft and Amazon, it's really ballooning up right now. When I mean, one's trying to spend, I think, 40 plus billion dollars a year um, into expanding a lot of their data center capacity. Now, you could say that, oh, that's going to take out a lot of uh, you know, operational cash flow or, or help, uh, you know, bend margins maybe in the near term. But I would argue that their business is becoming stronger by the day because nobody else can replicate this stuff. I mean, it's not easy to come up with these many billions of dollars to come up with their data centers. And in fact, I would say that companies that have their own data centers may be forced to close out and move a lot more stuff to the cloud because these guys have so much firepower with them. Oh, interesting. Hey, Anurag, I know the company here, uh, Anthropic, offers a chatbot named Claude, but the company's... Oh, or, or the I totally Claude. want a chatbot named Claude. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but they're kind of emphasizing developing AI safely and responsibly. It, where are we on that whole concept of safety and responsibility for a technology that most of us really don't fully grasp. It's like when a company's like, I want to be profitable. It's like, well, I hope yeah, so. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, you know, Paul and Alex, I'm still waiting for uh, that in the social media applications. Uh, yep. You know, so, so I do not know how that's going to shape up. But one of the things that we have seen with Claude is they are marketing themselves as being better than OpenAI in certain aspects. I think that's, you know, again, that's the company saying, so please, you know, take that into account, that a lot of their uh, experiments have said that Claude's better at certain things than OpenAI is. So, I mean, what's the next thing for Amazon? I'm, like, I'm, I'm just wondering if there's not much to go out there and buy to automatically give you yeah. AI scale. critical mass, yeah. scale. Even if you're Amazon, you can't just write a check like you can in, 
in Hollywood, for example, if you want to get into t to that business, is this just the That's tech industry point. just, I guess, putting their R&D, putting their CapEx, putting their funding to yeah. all things AI going forward? Yeah, I, I absolutely say that. Now think about it this way. Currently what's happening is Microsoft is reaping the benefits of you and I using ChatGPT more. So if we do more processing, Microsoft get the benefits of it. Now what Amazon is saying that, listen, that's one way to make money in AI. How about I do this? I'll give you all the raw materials for you to go out and build your own chatbot internally, let's say for a bank or for a beverage company. If you want to do that, then come to my cloud. I have all the raw material for you. I have all the models and I will do it safely for you. And that's Amazon's pitch, which means that the revenue fall through may be a little bit longer than what we are seeing at Microsoft. And then do we know how sticky those customers are? Like if Amazon's like, hey, I'll do all this stuff for you, and I'm like, cool, and I stay there? Or is it, I guess I'm getting at, is there a first mover advantage to that? Yeah, from a, from a, Alex, from a logical point of view, once you choose a cloud vendor to do any kind of process, it could be just your back office work, it is very difficult for you to get rid of that, and that's the whole point of cloud. So what essentially both of them are selling, not so much an AI, but they're basically selling, just come to my cloud and start using it, because once you start using it, you're not going to go anywhere else. Does Apple have an hmm. AI strategy? Well, we'll find out on uh, WWDC, I believe in June, that they're going to go out and basically you know, put the AI into Apple, but uh, that's going to be fun to see what happens over there. The initial response, or at least discussions that we are seeing, is that they're going to try to outsource that a little bit to Google. And if they do, I think their reception is going to be very strong. If they basically say, we're going to just do it in-house, then we don't know how long it's going to take for those products to really evolve. Um, so I think this is, that is one of the pivotal moment for Apple as it, as it relates to their sales and profit growth over the next 12 to 24 months. Can I go to, can I go to this conference or do you have to be like invite only? I think it's invite only. I've been uh, sorry, Paul. Yeah, I'm not I, think make that I think you could make it. <laughs> you know everybody. He knows all the people. Um, know. Anurag, I'm looking at Amazon stock at 181.21. Uh, um, it, do you feel like all, I know that their cloud business might be different, but the AI part of all of this, do you feel like it's accurately priced or how do you model it? It's, it's see, it's very difficult to price any of the AI related revenue because at the end of the day, it all, is, it all goes to the cloud. So, I mean, that's how, what we want to see. Mm. Having said that, as I said, it's going to take a little bit longer for Amazon to uh, monetize a lot of these things. So, we are not building in any kind of our projections looking into, you know, when they report earnings next month. We think it's going to be still about, you know, six to 12 months out. Um, we, but for Microsoft, because it's a direct you know, usage of chat GPT, I think they're going to get, uh, you know, a bigger boost than anybody else at this point. All right, Anurag Rana, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Anurag Rana, Senior Technology Analyst, Bloomberg Intelligence, uh, phoning it in, zooming it in from somewhere. Um, looking at <laughs> Amazon.com, stock's up 19% today. Uh, I'm sorry, 19% year to date. All time high for this name. I love putting up the long-term chart, like from the beginning of time. Because remember, this, this stock was nowhere for a yeah. while because they were losing money hand over fist. And then at some point, Jeff Bezos got the street to just switch it on a dime and say, don't worry about profits. We're investing in the future and our future is great. You, you, don't, you want us investing in the future. You don't want us delivering uh, EPS to you. For years and years and years that didn't work and then we hit an inflection and boom. Because I think people realize, oh, this thing, you can sell more than just books on this thing. Right, 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 right. Oh, right. now I understand. You're it. just not a Barnes & Noble competitor anymore. <laughs> exactly. You're, you're, you're something else. But you know, that, that's a, such a great point because I feel like when you when we talk to any company about, look at our new AI offering, look at this cool partnership we have with Microsoft, look at what we're doing with Amazon. It's really hard for lay people like me to understand what that means. Yep. Like, is it a tangible thing? Is it just, you know, a sexy bell and whistle that's not gonna actually do anything materially for you? Yep. And it, it's hard to kind of weed through all the stuff, to be honest, which is why I guess it's good we have Anurag and stuff. Exactly, I mean, for me, AI, to me, is what's incremental on the CapEx spend that everybody talks about over the next five years and what is just more just repositioning some other CapEx spending. That's kind of, for me. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Max Chapkin joins us. He's a Bloomberg Business Week senior reporter. Uh, he's got his piece entitled, uh, Bankman Fried's Original Sin at FTX is trouble for all of crypto. Max, thanks so much for joining us here. Really appreciate you taking the time here. 
I think at the crypto industry, if you speak, if you think about it as a broad entity, they'd like to put all this behind it. Yeah, absolutely. And and when you look at who has been most sort of most vociferous in uh, calling out Sam Bankman-Fried, you sort of have two groups. One are, are some crypto critics, but actually a lot of the crypto companies themselves, because the idea here is this guy is a bad apple. We got to get him out. We got to excise him from the industry, which is understandable. But but as we as we write in the story, you know, there's some problems with that. And and the main problem is that that a lot of the conditions that made FTX possible continue, and the crypto industry is essentially trying to deregulate the industry for, further. So sort of responding to this crisis by saying we need fewer rules, not more. Um, is that gonna? Would that have made a difference? If there were more rules, yeah, yeah of because, course. But, but, I mean, but, but but how? Because he was actively lobbying sort of Congress to do stuff. Like he wanted that. So doesn't that so, fly in the face of if more rules, he wouldn't have been able to do what he did? He. So this is like a, a, a sort of common misunderstanding, I think. I mean, just because he's lobbying for Congress doesn't mean that he's he's wanting to be regulated. He was lobbying for rules that would have been, you know, conducive to what he wanted to do. I mean, the central thing is FTX was operating offshore, quote unquote, operating in the Bahamas, um, officially not selling products to Americans, although we know from what's happened since that Americans were finding their way into some of these banned products. A lot of these crypto companies have been wanting to bring that model to the United States. Like, that's the big thing. That is what Sam Bankman-Fried was trying to do and what many in crypto essentially still want to do. Are there people, is it a fair criticism of the industry or maybe some of the leading people in the crypto industry that the industry itself and, the, and, the, and some of the leaders enabled Sam Bankman-Fried along the way and that simply trying to wash your hands of it at this point is you know, disingenuous? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, FTX was entirely enmeshed in the industry, investing in many of the companies, you know, during the uh, sort of collapse of the crypto markets in 2022, bailed out many of the companies. You know, remember all these headlines around uh, describing Sam Bankman-Fried as the, you know, as, as the savior of the crypto industry, as, as the Warren Buffett of crypto, as the next Warren Buffett. And those all came because, because this was a company that was putting huge sums of money into all these other companies. And it's the reason why the markets crashed uh, further in the weeks and months after the FTX bankruptcy. So, so yes, absolutely. Although, of course, that's like a somewhat awkward question. And also, there have been differences in approach. It's not like, it's not like all of the companies are operating in the exact same way. I think Coinbase has legitimately made more of an effort uh, on, on the regulatory front than, say, FTX. But Coinbase is also trying to deregulate in various ways. Um, what about the recovery? So I feel like a lot of this is spent on, uh, you know, Bernie Madoff's victims, for example, didn't get anything back. And therefore, if Sam Bankman frieds victims got some back, then that should reduce his jail time. Talk us through that. So, at, in fact, Bernie Madoff's victims have, have gotten money back. So 90%. Oh, okay. so, that's not even right. so, this is, so this, initially, of course, they lost all their money. But in the years since, and, and it's, you know, many years now, 90% of the initial investment from the Madoff victims has been recovered. Now, that doesn't, like, the Madoff victims are still very unhappy. And even if they get to 100%, still going to be very unhappy because not having access to your money for years yeah. Or even decades, and not even knowing it, that's is, gonna happen. Yeah, too. and they're mm -hmm. huge. Mm -hmm. And as many of the victims have pointed out in this case, getting a hundred percent of your assets back at the time of bankruptcy years later is still difficult. People have have suffered extreme emotional distress. Like you know, their lives have essentially been ruined. Um, so so there's that point. But then there's the legal matter, which is it doesn't matter. And the judge brought this up. Uh, in in the proceeding today, you know, if you squander, if you steal customer money, or, or and take it to your, in your put in your pocket, walk into a Vegas casino, and then later pay the, you know, somebody else comes along and pays them off, that doesn't change the legal situation. So so there's a moral question of like, well, what does it mean if they've been able to recover their money? And then there's the legal one. For the legal one, it just it doesn't matter. And I'm just you know reading your story here. Unfortunately, the conditions that allowed people to fall for schemes such as Bankman Fried's. Those, a lot of those conditions still remain here. And is there, where are we in just terms of the regulatory framework? Is there any agreement maybe how this should evolve over time? No. Um, I mean, we, we have seen certain, I, I, I don't know if you want to call it progress. I mean, of course, there are like, the SEC approved certain spot uh, Bitcoin ETFs. Um, there's now a big d debate, you know, within the industry. Should should they allow for other spot ETFs, say Ethereum or or other um, assets that are, are maybe not as well established as Bitcoin? The SEC, Gary Gensler, has been uh, pretty cool to that possibility. Uh, you know, the the industry, you know, backing up. 
there's a ton of money coming in here. Yep. Uh, crypto prices are soaring. Um, yep. A lot of the same kind of frothy enthusiasm that we saw in the pre-FTX collapse. It's there, you know, and in, in certain ways it's worse, right? But during the FTX buildup, we were talking about all the wonderful use cases for crypto. Blockchain was going to change everything. And when you actually listen to what people in the crypto industry are talking about lately, they're just more talking about the numbers going up and the fact that, yeah, you have new money coming in through these ETFs and, and we're seeing all of these tokens, some tokens where, where really there's nothing going on besides vibes, you know, these quote unquote meme coins that are also soaring. And in fact, yep. many of the tokens that have gone up the most are the same tokens that were going up during the FTX run up. Hmm. So I, I think there is certainly, when you're, when you're talking about huge amounts of speculation, there is going to be pain ahead for, for some of the speculators. Of course, there's also the potential for ever more wealth. So, um, so that's the tension. Before I let you go, we have like a minute left. Um, we have later on on TV William Quigley, who's the co-founder of Tether. What's my question <laughs> for him? I mean, based, I, based, based I think like uh, the, the, the Tether situation, one of the things that's craziest about this, if you, if you went back 10 years ago, or, or five years ago and asked, you know, which company is most likely to run into issues, regulatory issues, and so on, people, you know, Tether was one that, that crypto skeptics have brought up over and over again over the years, and they have managed to stick it out and, and, and are still here at a time when, you know, the CEO of Binance is headed for prison, uh, you know, the former CEO of FTX, former CEO of Binance, former CEO of FTX also appears to be headed to prison. Um, so, so that's impressive. I do wonder how Tether... Uh, tries to to adjust further or if they have plans to adjust further right for for years people have wanted to see more information about what's on their balance sheets and they've essentially resisted so mm. i'm curious what their plans are going forward max great stuff uh zeke fox max chafkin they've got this really good story i i, I just keep scrolling down and there's more and more and more good <laughs> stuff here bankman fried's original sin at ftx is trouble for all of crypto, for all our listeners and viewers out there that are, uh, you know, interested in this space, go to Bloomberg.com uh, and find this story because it is really good reporting, some really cool stuff in there. Um, so check it out there. Uh, Max Chapkin, he, he does all that stuff for Bloomberg at Business Week. This is the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live each weekday, 10 a.m. to noon Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, tune in, and the Bloomberg Business App. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.